Good morning. I think we can uh, start. So this is week two of the information retrieval lecture. And it is time to start doing technical things. Um, after last week's lecture, where I spent more time introducing the topic to you and giving the general motivation. I would like to come back just as an introduction of today to start with, with the data shapes, because this is really something extremely important in databases that whenever you have data, it has a shape. Can you remember the shapes of data that I introduced last week? One of them is 4,000 years old. Tables and I think to wake you up, there's nothing better than the interactive clicker application. I will try that. So let me tell you the shape. So we have tables, we have trees, we have graphs, we have cubes, and we have unstructured texts. And tables and unstructured texts are the oldest data shapes that we've ever had in mankind. And this lecture is going to be focused on unstructured text. It seems very simple. It seems like the most trivial data shape you can have, but in terms of databases, it is the most difficult to query. And today, it's becoming easier, not only because we have some techniques and we are capable of automating some things, but because also of research in natural language processing, in machine learning, and so on. So as innocent as this may look, this is the most tricky data shape to query. And it's worth 13 weeks of uh, lecture. So information retrieval is about finding unstructured data, no tables, no trees, no graphs, nothing, just text. We can be images, videos, and so on, but unstructured. That satisfies an information need because you always have to think in terms of use case. When you start a project, when you design a system, you have to ask yourself, what is it going to be used for? In that case, the need is we have a huge library or collection of books, of text, or videos, of images, and we have people that want to look for something. And there, there is this need. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a search engine worth hundreds of uh, billions of dollars on the stock markets. So there is an information need. And it is within large collections, because for small collections, as interesting as it may be, but we will start with this, um, you cannot go very far because the whole point of searching information is if it's hard to find it. So um, let's say you have some text somewhere stored on your local machine. It's not so much text. Let's say it's just a few files. And you are looking for some words in these files. You're all computer scientists. How do you proceed? Yes? Control, sorry? Control, Control F, yes, absolutely. So you open the file in some, uh, in some uh, text editor, and then Control F is very often, or Apple F if you're using a, a, a Mac. Um, yes, that is a way of doing that. Um, you are already relying, in that case, on the fact that somebody already implemented what you're looking for. Um, now, this is the right way to start, but imagine you don't have an application like that, and let's say you want to do something a bit more geeky, like you don't have a UI or a fancy UI. So wh what do you do? It should be automatic for you. What do you do? On the command line? Yes? I grab it. You grep it, exactly. You use grep. This is exactly how you would start it. And actually, when you, when you use Control F, this is pretty much what is uh, happening. Or if you use Emacs or VI, maybe it's not Control F. But. So imagine that we have this. So now it's public domain, right? Because it's been, uh, that's Sherlock Holmes. Um, I think that uh, the TA team is going to use uh, Shakespeare, which is also a, a classics. But now I'm basically allowed to quote that because that's uh, public domain. So let's say I have this file here with three, megab three megabytes. And I want to query for the word lawyer. Then I can use grep. So if I just look at it, let's do the control F first. If I do the control F, then something like this is going to happen. It's going to highlight somewhere in the text that I found the word lawyer. 
Um, the naive approach on the command line would be something like this. You grab, and here you will see all the lines appearing. It's not the original text. It's really, you can see on every line there is lawyer. Lawyer here, lawyer here, uh, lawyer, lawyer. So please believe me, I really did that on the command line. There is lawyer on every line. And there is a, of, a couple of things that you can do with grep. It's, it's, it's already, it already has some very useful functionality. For example, <coughs> you can do end queries. You can look for lines that have two words by using pipes. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, here, for example, you can query for lawyer and Penang. And here you go two lines of text that, has, that have both words in any order. You can see just that uh, you have them. So in that case, you can already see some structure in the search because we are taking one search result with one word and then filtering further with the other search result, right? And then you can even have uh, the negation because it supports uh, with dash V, you can negate and so on, and then you can uh, filter further. Um, but the thing is, oh, before I tell you what the thing is, you even have regular expressions. I mean, you all know grep, right? Who knows grep? Who doesn't? OK, so for those who do not, grep even has regular expressions where you can even find some fancy, uh, fancy um, uh, words where you don't exactly know how they are spelled and so on and so on. This is also something that we will do on larger scales. But grep allows you to do that. But grep has a few shortcomings. And this is where I want to wake you up. Oh, I will ask that one later. Sorry, I forgot to start with that one. But let's give you the grep question. So which one of these is a shortcoming of grep? There may be multiple answers. Oh, did I allow multiple answers? I'm not sure. But if I didn't, then just pick one. Who wasn't here last week? And did you watch the recording? OK, so let me tell you, just so you know how you do that. So you go to eduapp-app1.ethd.ch with your mobile phone or with your laptop. Uh, and then you can connect with your Nets login for everybody who didn't know that. And then once you connect, if you register for the lecture, you should see the questions appear. So we have 13 votes. But there are 26 of you in the room, so it means I should wait a bit more. Can you raise your hand if you're not done yet? You need it time to switch on your smartphone? Nobody? OK, let me show the answers. 20 now. Very good. So these are the three right answers, correct answers. It cannot rank results. This is true. You just receive the results by order of arrival. Um, it sometimes returns documents that do not, uh, oh, that do not contain the term being looked up. Sorry for the typo. Um, this is not true. We will see what it means today. Uh, it does not have proximity semantics. That is, that is um, correct. It does not scale up so easily. It does not always return. Oh, my, what did I drink when I, when I wrote these questions? Two typos. Uh, it does not return always, all the matches always. Yes, it does. I mean, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty simple implementation, so it does return all of them. And it does support wildcards, because these are the, these are the uh, regular expressions. So let me come back on the slides to the three main shortcomings that we want to address. The first one is that. If you want to search something that is extremely large, not just a few files, but let's say the entire web, um, you know, the, um, sometimes you think, you know, how hard can it be? Um, grep, if you have plenty of documents, why don't you just run it in parallel, build some script that distributes it over a machine, and then you send the files over to the to the machines, and then you grab in parallel everywhere. How hard can it be? 
and the how hard can it be in IT, uh, you see it all the time, and it always ends badly because you realize that it's actually harder than what you would have thought. And actually, this is how uh, this started, for example. Um, this is a quote from a, from a book uh, that I found. To do it right, his old page, you'd really have to capture a significant chunk of the World Wide Web's link structure. So here, the goal is to query the web. Then follows, we're going to download the web. That's pretty ambitious, right? And at the time, people were a bit skeptical about this, but they, were, they basically wanted to download the entire web. And of course, this is the how hard can it be part, that it's only going to take a week, because how hard can it be to download the web? And it took, in the end, years. And this is the typical setting. Be very careful when you think something is extremely simple. It may seem simple to just distribute grep over machines, but it really is not. Um, so this is the first shortcoming. The second one is that we would also like to have something like this. And if you use Google, you can actually see that it does it um, automatically, even if you don't really put any keywords. Uh, it will still um, favor the pages where the words are close to each other. And when I say favor, this is actually what I mean is that the whole point of having a search engine when you have millions potentially here, 72,000 results, you can just not return the results by some arbitrary order like the creation date of the page and so on and so on. You have to rank them in some way, right? You have to make sure that this is what the user wants and this is the idea of page rank. Um, and grep cannot do that. Grep is just going to go through the files and give you in sequential order all the lines where it found the world, right? So these are the three things that we would like to have. It should scale elegantly. Uh, it should have some proximity search features. Um, and it should be able to rank in the end. So we are not going to be, to be doing ranking today, a bit later in the semester. But these are just a few of the features that we are lacking and the reasons why uh, we need something better. So um, one good way of doing that, and this is what any search engine is actually doing, is to pre-process the data. This is something very general when you are programming or querying data or doing some operations. Um, you can do it unprepared, meaning that you can just start doing whatever it is you want to do directly on the data, such as Control F or grep. For this, you didn't warn your computer before. You just start grepping, but the computer had no idea that you were going to grep, OK? Um, you can be much faster and more efficient if you prepare in advance some data structure that is going to help you um, be faster when you actually search. And you have probably been there. If you have a book like this, before computers were even invented and you were looking for something, um, you had almost no choice but looking at the table of contents, right? And trying to understand how it's organized. It was, it was the paradigm of Yahoo when they were created, where you have some structure in the information and then you just think about the semantics of what you are searching and then you find the right chapter. But in some cases, it just doesn't work. So even before computers were invented, it became a habit to have at the end of the book some index page. It's exactly how it looks on the screen, where um, you look up the words here alphabetically, and it tells you the page, and then you go to the page. You probably have seen that for since you were a child. Um, but the importance of that is really uh, the pre-processing aspect, the fact that before you even start querying everything, before even knowing what the query is, you prepare this, and then you can use it in order to make the query faster. And then it's always a compromise, because this consumes space, so you save time for the query. It's going to be much faster to find the page containing the information you're looking for, but it takes more pages in the book. In most books, it's no problem, because the price of a few more pages is definitely worth the time that people would spend searching for information, right? But this whole compromise between time and space uh, is extremely important in all of IT. So we save some time by consuming some space. So ideally, we would like to build exactly that for our information, um, I, for information system. We would like to build some index, not just on one document, or like in that case, just a book, but in general, 
um, for a big system. So let me just introduce some terminology here. We have the concept of a document. Um, a document is just a unit of information, and we will go back in details about how to define this next week. But it's typically when you Google or when you go to, for example, here it's the uh, ETH library search uh, engine. A document is basically each item that appears in the results. So typically that has a different link or a different ID and so on. You can view a document as a sequence. These are other examples, these are books, as a sequence of terms. Um, and a term is just a fancy word for any sequence of characters that makes sense. So it's typically words like Sherlock, lawyer, Switzerland, uh, Nidval, Teteratsuri, person, watch, run, paper, book, all of these are terms. Okay? So now I have the notion of documents and the notion of terms. What I am doing here, it sounds very trivial, um, but what I'm doing here is abstracting away from reality. We have some complex problems searching information in some books or in some systems. I am simplifying this by just abstracting what I need. What I need is the notion of documents and the notion of term. And then I have the notion of a document containing terms or not. Um, for now, I can even drop the order. I even abstract away from the notion that there may be an order of the words in the documents. So you see what I'm doing here? It is actually, you, you could call that a data model. This is kind of a data model. It's the what are we dealing with part of the data model. It's the equivalent of the notion of table with rows and columns for a relational database or for data that looks like a tree of having children in a tree and navigating through the children or in a cube having dimensions or in a graph having nodes and edges and so on and so on, right? But for, for unstructured text, the equivalent abstraction from the real world is in terms of having many documents, many terms, and a relationship between the documents and the terms that the documents can contain terms. Okay? So now, if we abstract away from reality, imagine we have plenty of books like this, we abstract away from reality with documents and terms, what can I do with this? How can I, how can I prepare some structure that abstracts this away? Any ideas? Think of this relationship between documents and terms. How can I, how can I um, display that, for example? How can I show something visual about that? So I could show you the book directly, right? This is something visual. But here there is too much information. Th there is much more than just the, the relationship between documents and terms. So what would it look like? Giving you a bit of time. Yes? Yes, interesting. So, okay, I like that because you're using data structure terminology. So, um, you're basically saying one interesting thing, which is the duplicate elimination, right? You, you may have terms that occur more than once in the document, so you would eliminate them, okay? So, here you're basically transforming a sequence, a, a, a list of terms within the document to a set of terms, okay? That's already something interesting. You're already abstracting away from a list to a set. Uh, can you be more precise in the way that you would uh, represent that? How would you visually show that? So at least, let, let, me, try, let me try it with what you suggest. Do I have chalk? So you're basically saying, let's use the convention that I'm going to give numbers to documents, document one, document two, document three, and the words I'm going to use letter, A, B, C, D, and so on. So basically you would have document one, and uh, you abstract it away with a set, for example, A, B, C, E, and documents two, you would have uh, A, D, F, I even sorted them just to show that it's a set and the duplicates are eliminated. So this is what you have in mind, right? Okay. Um, yes, this is one way of doing that. Um, now, is it useful to do a search? How, how easy it is to search for terms now in documents? Right? You can see that 
we have a very nice abstraction. We have all the information we need so we can have a correct implementation of an information retrieval system. Who thinks it's going to be fast? Some of you, well, here obviously it's going to be fast, but imagine that there's a million, a million entries like that. Who thinks it's going to be slow? Who doesn't know? Who is sleeping? Okay. So, indeed, this is going to be slow because the only way we can search for a word like that is going through each uh, set here and test for inclusion and then say whether or not we return the document. Right? So, can we slightly modify this uh, to, 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 like, let's say make it more symmetric? to facilitate the search. Yes? M maybe you this time, yes? <laughs> yes, exactly. And y you actually directly jump to the answer. This is actually great. So I'm going to take intermediate steps, but basically, yes, this is the, this is the idea. But I, I want you to have the mental picture of what we are doing here. So here, um, we have this model that documents contain or not terms, so we can start doing math with that. We can say, we can define some relationship between uh, a document and a term, which is one if the document contains the term, and zero if it does not. And what we actually get is something like this in, in terms of, uh, of uh, abstraction. We have the, 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 the model of the relationship abstracted away for each document and for each term. We have an entry here, for example, uh, for the term Y and the document 5, here it's 1, so it contains it, right? And here, you can see that it's already a bit faster to do the search because, uh, let's say that I even ask you. First query is here. So, just to check that you understood, what does query Y return? Let me zoom out. And you will see that this, this is also fast if you have a million documents. Well, let's say not completely fast, but faster than this, right? Because you no longer test, need to test for inclusion. Okay, so let's see. Okay, 19 at 20, I showed the answers. Yes, okay. So you see, most of you got it. Five, eight, 10. So all you need to do is look at Y here, to this line, to this row, and go through them and look for the one, 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 and one. This is five, this is eight, and this is 10. So this is the right result. What query would this have been? Yes? What query would this have been? Not why, exactly. And then, yeah, for answer. Okay, very good. Uh, another one. Which query returns the documents five and eight? So here I'm taking a different angle. It should be easy. I mean, you should really answer almost right away here. U and, oh, U and Y, exactly. So you actually took the intersection, so Y is basically 5, 8, 10, and U is 5, 6, 7, 8, and the intersection is 5 and 8. So yes, U and Y, okay. Normally, you should find this easy. Who finds it easy? Okay, perfect, so I can accelerate. Uh, the reason, you know, 
it seems very trivial what I'm doing here. I mean, you know how, how it, it's, it's just matrices and lines and rows and so on and so on. But what I'm actually teaching you here is not um, just looking at the matrix and finding the ones in a row. It's really this idea of abstracting away from reality, that you have the real world and you are extracting something from the real world and simplify it so much that it looks trivial. And once it's done, it looks trivial, but actually doing it is less trivial because you need to make design decisions such as, do I want to preserve the order? If yes, I need to use lists. If not, I need to use sets, and so on and so on and so on. So you need to take an abstraction of the world, a simple abstraction, as simple as possible, but not simpler. Okay, so formally, this is basically just uh, the set of Booleans uh, exponentiated to the Cartesian product of terms and documents, okay? Um, so if you have a query, this is the example we saw, you just look at the row, take the ones, and that gives you the documents. If you have a, non, a not something query, you have to do one more operation by inverting the rows, and then that gives you the uh, documents. If you have an end query, you need to compute the um, bitwise end, like this, and then that gives you the, uh, the results. And if you have or, you do a bitwise or, like this, and this gives you the, uh, the results, right? Right? Okay. So this is, um, this is the, the, the first approach in terms of, of model is to use this incidence matrix, um, and that gives you the relationship between the, the terms and the documents. We are going to change that data structure to something even more efficient, but before that I would like to um, take a small break and uh, talk to you about the effectiveness of an information system. So imagine that we have a user searching for something, so they have something in their mind. There's many ways that you can implement a query out of that. And the idea here is that implicitly today, what we've been doing from the start, we've been doing that with grep, and we've been doing that with this matrix model that we just had we are basically simplifying the kind of queries we can do to some Boolean-based system. That's why it's called Boolean querying, and that's why today's lecture is called Boolean querying. So the idea is that we have end or not, and we have terms, and we can do queries like this. We can also imagine some extensions, though not today, with near and so on and so on. But here there is a bit of an impedance mismatch between here and here. So you can see that if you think in these terms, Boolean queries, then you will get exactly the documents that match and only the documents that match, right? It's going to be a perfect result. But in reality, you do have the notion that it may slightly differ here. So you may actually return documents that the user is not really looking for, or you may miss documents that the user was actually looking for. And the reasons for that are mainly due to the, to the mismatch right here, okay? So once you have a user, with an information need in mind, and then they translated this information need into a Boolean query, or you did, or somebody did, you get results, and basically, for today, a result is either included or not included, right? The document is either in the results or not in the results. We are not doing any ranking, and so on, and so on. So it's either green or red. So the idea is that in the list of the results that we return here, um, Forget about the colors, I didn't use them that way. So we, we return documents. Um, the green or red code here means that the green ones were actually something that the user was looking for, and the red ones, they were not looking for these documents, so technically they are incorrect, but they were included in the results, okay? So these are all the search results. The user needed these ones, the user didn't need these ones. And we have the notion of precision, who already heard of that before, precision? Recall? Okay, this is new, perfect. So the precision is a simple division, it's just a ratio between two things. You are looking at the documents that were returned and that the user was actually looking for, divided by the total number of returned documents. So it's the green divided by red plus green, okay? And in different terms, the documents that um, are returned 
and that the user really wants it, these are called the true positives. Right? These are called the true positives. True um, because um, true negatives. Oh, I, I always I always get a headache with these things. So true because it is correct, and positives because it was actually returned. So positive means that the, the search engine returned it, and true means that the user was actually looking for it. So the true positives divided by the total number of uh, returned uh, results, the positives. Okay. So can you tell me intuitively? Um, if, you were, if we have an extremely high precision, what does it mean in terms of what we would have on the screen? If I have a very high precision, yes? There will? Yes, exactly. So it means that we will have a lot of things here and almost nothing there, right? And some very low precision means that we would have a lot of results here that the user didn't want and very few results that they actually wanted. So it indicates very poor quality because we're actually giving to the user something that they, don't, they do not really actually want. So in that case, oh, yeah, well, obviously you saw it. In that case, we have a precision of 50%, right? Because it's eight divided by 16. So 50% is we just return as many that as relevant as some that as, as documents that are not relevant. And as we said, that would be 100%, and that would be 0% precision. Okay, so that gives you just a ballpark of how to estimate. 50%, 100% precision, 0% precision. Okay? What is the precision of this result? Yes? 80%. Yes. Okay? 80%. Right. So now, let's extend our view. Let's extend our view and also consider the documents that we did not actually return. Because here we only had documents that the search engine actually returned to the user, whether relevant or not. But there's also many documents that are in the database, they are indexed, they are in the system, but we did not return them. Why do we need to also look at these documents? The idea is simply that some of the documents we did not return would actually have been documents that the user wanted to see. So this is why we need to look at them as well. Um, these are negatives because they are not returned, but this one here, these ones here should have been returned to the user. They were looking for them. These ones, we did not want to return them, we did not return them, so all is good. So basically, this is good. We returned relevant documents. This is good. We did not return ir irrelevant documents. But here and here, we have a problem. Here, we have the problem that we return irrelevant documents. And here, we have the, problems, the problem that we did not return relevant documents. And both of these issues are actually very important. So we need to look at the other side of things. Instead of looking on the road here, looking at the, the, the the green documents and the red documents. Instead of this, we are looking right here at the relevant documents and asking ourselves, in the relevant documents the user was looking for, how many of them did we actually give to the user? This is called the recall. This is called the recall. And in order to compute the recall, we divide the number of true positives by the total number of trues of relevant documents. Okay. The true poly positive divided by the relevant document. In that case, we have a recall of 50% because amongst the relevant documents, we returned half of them to the user. Okay? This is 100%. 100% recall means everything that there was to return, we did return it. So we found everything there was to find and returned it to, use, to the user. We have 100% of recall. And 0% of recall, this is totally useless. We did not even give anything to the user that they could have actually, uh, th th that was relevant to them. We, we, um, we did not give anything useful to the user. Okay? Uh, this is an example of recall, for example, of 67%, two thirds. Again, the green divided by the sum of the green and the blue. Okay? 
so, so you remember the big picture, there is another name. So this is really something, I'm not sure if it's for everybody the same. I think some persons, it's easier, the brain is structured in a way it's easier to remember. I always get confused on these things. So we have here the false negatives because we did not return them, but we should have. And here we have the false positive because we did, we did return them, but we should not have returned them. Okay? So false negatives here and false positives here. This is also called type 1 error when you have false positives and type 2 error when you have false negatives. Okay? So this is ver very relevant for information systems, but it's actually bigger than that. There are many other disciplines that use this idea of false positive, false negatives, type 1 error, type 2 error. It is used, for example, in statistics, uh, in finance, when you want to test a hypothesis, you don't know if a hypothesis or an assumption is true or not, then you run an experiment, and then you may draw a conclusion. But the conclusion may actually be true, it may be false, you may have not drawn a conclusion you should have, and so on and so on. So this is something much bigger than information retrieval, the idea of these type 1 errors and these type 2 errors. So what is the ideal precision and recall that we would like to have in our system? This is a very easy question. I'm just checking your following. Two numbers? Anybody? Yes? 100% and 100%, exactly. This is what we would actually wish for. Uh, this is what we would wish for, but in reality, that's actually not what happens. In reality, getting 100% precision and 100% of recall happens in simple cases. Do you think you have that with grep? Who thinks grep gives you 100% Assuming that the query you're searching for is exactly what you type on the command line, who thinks that grep has 100% precision? Who does not? Okay, so we have everybody. Who thinks grep has 100% of recall? Yes, it does. It has 100% of precision and of recall. But grep, it's because we are at very small scales. But in, in reality, when you start having very big systems, when you start having this impedance mismatch between what the user is looking for and the translation into a query, which may not be accurate, that's one possibility that could hurt the precision and recall. The other thing that could hurt precision and recall is when you start optimizing things to make things faster, for example, uh, if you have millions and billions of pages, you may, you may change the code in a way to be faster at the cost of incorrectness. You, you may say, okay, we are going to approximate this and to approximate that and return this and this and these pages to the user. It may not be perfect. We may return irrelevant pages. We may miss relevant pages, false positive, false negatives. So it's the price to pay for being extremely fast returning the queries to the user. So typically, the two settings that you can be in is a very high precision. A very high precision, remember, this is where we look at for the precision, where we have most of what we return is actually irrelevant, but we may have a very bad recall because we did not actually return so many documents to the user. Um, it's actually, if you want to think on how to implement a system like that, you would basically implement a very conservative system. If you want to achieve uh, um, very high precision, you can return just a few documents that you are absolutely certain are relevant to the user, and you will have a very high precision. But maybe you are going to miss 99% of those you should have returned, right? So this is one of the extremes of the spectrum, is you are highly precise, you really only return absolutely high quality, uh, high quality documents, but maybe you are missing a lot of them. Okay? But in some cases, this is what you want. If the user really just wants this, then this is fine. For example, if a company is recruiting people, they want to recruit the right people. High precision for a company means of the people they recruit, almost all of them 
are actually very high quality and it was a good idea to recruit them. This is high precision. Does a company care for high recall? Maybe they don't. Because why does it matter if they, if, if, let's say they hire a thousand persons, they hire the thousand persons and maybe uh, 990 or 999 are absolutely top-notch engineers. Uh, this is high precision. Maybe there's a million more in the world, such engineers that are absolutely top-notch. Top and they, they basically missed most of them. They did not recruit most of them. But they don't care because what they want in a company is high precision. They don't care about high recall. So what they want, if they have, have, they have high precision, is to avoid false positives. And the cost of avoiding false positives is that you may have false negatives, OK? So this is, let's think in your mind of the recruitment system of a company where we want high precision, OK? The other side of things would be high recall. High recall means that you don't like false negatives. You don't want to um, miss a search result. What you want is to be complete. You want to be absolutely sure that you have absolutely everything in there. Okay? Um, and the price to pay for this, of having very few false negatives in order to have high recall, is that you may, in the process, get a lot of irrelevant results. This is the price to pay. What do you do in this case? Imagine that you, have a, you, you don't want to miss a thing, so you take a high recall system. What do you do after that? Once you have the results, there is a last step that is required. You can just get the results and post-process them and filter them in memory, right? So you can turn something that is high recall into also high precision by post-processing the data in there. But it's, again, additional costs. It's always about making compromises. OK? So there is this compromise to be done between high precision and high recall, achieving both at the same times when you, you, when you start having complex queries on large scale starts to be extremely hard to achieve. OK? This is also something that you will see in uh, machine learning, this uh, precision and recall. Even I, I will not go into the details of this. I'm assuming that you will also see that uh, in machine learning lectures, right? Whenever you, may, you need to make a decision about something, you, you may be wrong, you may be right. You may have high precision, you may have high recall. As far as we are concerned, we define it in terms of the search results. OK, who understands this compromise? OK, very good. So we should uh, take a break. Uh, just a question I will ask again in terms of um, understanding. Who thinks this is going too slow? Some of you, very good. Who thinks it is going too fast? Who thinks it's going exactly at the right speed? OK, in between. OK, so this is very good for, for later that I can adapt. So uh, let's take a break. And uh, I'll see you in uh, 15 minutes at uh, quarter past 10. OK, let's uh, start again. So um, coming back on uh, too slow, too fast. Um, here's my teaching philosophy. I, I will share this with you because this is, um, this is the way that I work. Um, this thing with high precision and high recall, this is ex exactly the same thing in terms of teaching. Meaning that when I ask you these questions, uh, who thinks it's too slow, who thinks it's too fast, who thinks it's exactly at the right speed, you actually answered in exactly the way that I want it, meaning that almost nobody answered that I was too fast. Some of you answered that I was too slow, and also many of you answered that I was at the right speed. And this is exactly right in the sense that I want nobody left behind, and I want as many of, as, of you as possible to succeed at the exam. 
And the, the nice thing about this way of thinking is that it can be interpreted in, in terms of high precision and high record as well, which is a good Ezelsbrücke. Um, high precision basically means that the material that I'm going to teach you is selected and I'm going to try every time to go in as many details as possible in such a way that you know it in and out. And you must know everything I'm teaching you today in and out, not approximately or roughly or have a rough understanding. You must know that in and out. And if most of you know every, everything that I'm teaching you in and out, this is super high precision. And I know that, as in every class, some of you um, would have liked it faster because you can process even more. Um, high recall would mean that I teach much, much faster. I throw much more material, um, maybe not going as deep into it because I would leave it up to you. But then I wouldn't have high precision anymore because a lot of you will then find it too fast. And in terms of teaching, the way that I, that I see teaching is I want as many of you to succeed, as many of you to know everything there is to know about the material and as deep as possible. And this is exactly also the reason why we have these programming exercises, because there is nothing better than actually programming and implementing something to double check that you understood something. So I will continue to, uh, to, to do it that way, to go in depth. And for those of you who um, maybe are a bit bored or think it could be faster, what I recommend, the way that you can make even more of this lecture, when you implement stuff, push it even more. Try to implement more features. Uh, I will give you a few, uh, a few uh, hints on how you can do this. Um, I think this, is, this high precision, high recall is, uh, is uh, really how I see things. I want high precision. So um, let us continue the lecture. Uh, I'm going back to this data structure that I had here. So what, he did, what we did is we transformed that to a matrix. This matrix would basically look like this. We have one and two, and we have A, B, C, D, E, O, and F. Um, and then we have A, B, C, E, and zero and zero. And then we have A, D, F, which is A, D, F. So we have this matrix. And you see that this already makes it easier to query because instead of having to go through all the sets testing for inclusion, you just need look at the row. And then you, uh, you look at the ones, and that gives you the documents. So normally, everybody here should understand what we've been doing. Um, but now let me show you something that is actually a problem with this approach. Um, if you count, typically in a, in a very large system, I, ca I can give you some ballpark that uh, the book actually gives, the number of terms can be actually very huge. Uh, if you consider, it depends on the language, but in the English language, I think there's already something like 70,000 different words in, in the dictionary. If you include all the GRE word and SAT words and everything there is to find in English, there is typically 70,000. It's actually one of the languages with the most words because there's Latin words, Greek words, uh, Anglo-Saxon words, and so on. Um, but if you also consider the proper nouns and so on and so on, you typically uh, can achieve something as large as half a million terms. This is how high this matrix is. The documents, you can typically have a million documents. If you're indexing the web, it's even more. It's even billions. But let's say for a library, a million documents is, uh, is quite reasonable. Um, and I think that here you start seeing the problem, right? Because if you start computing the, uh, the number, the, the size that this matrix is going to take, it's 500 billion booleans, right? That is, that, is a lot of, uh, that is a lot of space. That takes a lot of space. And this is not even feasible in practice. Plus, another problem is if you actually do take a term and look for the documents, you will have to go through a list of one million 
uh, one million uh, zeros and ones to select the ones. So here, you may be faster than with the approach over there, um, because you don't test um, one million times for inclusion, but just if it's a zero or one, still it's very slow. So we need some better way of doing that. And we even more so need a better way to do that, that this is extremely inefficient. Because in practice, if you ask yourself how many zeros are going to actually be in there, a lot. If you consider that each document contains a thousand words, let's say, like it's, a, it's a, let's say, a chapter of a book or something. Um, to be more precise, I mean here distinct terms, right? So it may be actually longer than a thousand terms, but distinct terms, because remember, you use a set of terms and not a list of terms. If there's typically a thousand terms per document, you can count the number of ones, it's one billion. One billion of ones, but there was 500 billion of zeros and ones. That means that you have 499 billion zeros, and this is 99.8% empty. This is very bad. This is called a sparse matrix. And in these cases, computer scientists absolutely want to optimize things and, uh, and make this more space efficient, right? Um, so it's 99.8% empty, and we want to fix this. And one of you actually already gave the solution earlier. Um, but let me put it uh, as to the question. Let me first ask you if you think in terms of data structures. What is this a representation of? Mathematically, we had a relation. We had a relation between the set of terms and the set of documents, right? And a relation, remember, is a subset of the Cartesian product of the set, right? You, you did that in discrete math. Who took the discrete math lecture? It's mandatory, right? So you know what a relation is. So now, what visual structure can you build out of this? This is a representation of, how, how can you represent a relation? Yes? Yes, a relation is a set of tuples. How can you represent them visually? Typically when you do with Venn diagrams and so on, or diagrams. Just a graph, that's all I want you to say. This is what you wanted to say? Excellent. So this is a graph, actually, where you have A, B, C, D, E, F, and one and two, and then you connect them, A, B, C, E, and then we have A, D, and F. What kind of graph is this, by the way? What is it called? Yes? Bipartite, Bipartite exactly. Bipartite, because you have clearly two sets of nodes, and you only have edges between these two sets. So a mathematical relation can be represented as a bipartite graph. Now, you probably know that this is one way of representing a graph, and there's other ways of representing graphs. And maybe this is a good hint to actually answer the next question. Uh, sparsity issue. So how do we solve this sparsity issue? The fact that we have more than 99% of zeros in the matrix, it means we want to represent this. This is, in essence, what we want. We have a bipartite graph between terms and documents. We don't want to use this, uh, this uh, incidence matrix because this is very inefficient, but we have other ways of representing our structure. Did I start it? Yes.
property. Okay, let's see. I guess you will probably all almost get it right. Yes, exactly. And some fall, fell into the trap. So, uh, yes, this was the correct answer, where the majority was. The second answer, it's actually this. This was the original thought, where we list the terms contained in watch one each document. And yes, this is a way, but it's very inefficient. So what we do is exactly this, but the other way around. Instead, instead of uh, using this, the right-hand side of the graph uh, for each list, we do the opposite. We, s we take the terms here, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then we list the documents. So here we have one and two. Here we have just one. Here we have one. Here we have two. Here we have one. And here we have two. So you see that this here is just the dual of this, just the other way around. So this would be fully symmetric, this would be fully symmetric, and here it's asymmetric. But we want this asymmetry listing the terms and then the documents every time. Why? Because this is ultra efficient. Because now you take a term and it just directly gives you the answer. So if you look for D, then look at document two. If you look for A, look at documents one and two. Right? This gives you the, the answers. Uh, much faster, okay? Um, do you know what this is called? So first it's called an index, right? This is exactly the same thing you find at the last page of a book, but what adjective would qualify this index compared to the first one on the left? Inverted, right? This is called an inverted index. It's the idea that instead of listing of listing the documents themselves, we list the query terms themselves. Okay, this is called an inverted index. Very good. So this is space inefficient, and the idea is that you look at the ones, you compress that, just listing what you have, and there you go. You have an inverted index, right? It's just an alternate representation, but actually what we have is this. Okay. So. Now a few words to describe what we have. This is called the vocabulary, the term. The list of the terms here is called the vocabulary. We call it some, I think it's also called the dictionary, so there's several ways you can call that. This is the list that we have here, okay? Um, this is called the posting. A posting is what mathematically, just making sure you formally can describe it, what is a posting? Okay, let me give you this. We have a set of documents. We have a set of terms. So the relation between the two is, uh, so we have, let's say, a relation. That's an element of the power set of D times T, Cartesian product with T. So one graph like this is an element of this power set. Or you can also view this as a Boolean set of Booleans like this. Okay, so we have we can describe it very formally. But now I'm talking about one single one single thing in there. What is this? So I need a mathematical answer and I need a visual answer. Who knows but doesn't dare to answer? Who thinks it's too hard? Who thinks it's too easy? Who doesn't think? Okay. So this is just, let me give you the answer then. This is just an element of the Cartesian product. It's a tuple. You said it earlier. It's a tuple. It's a pair. In that case, a tuple with two elements is a pair. It's a pair document term. So every time you have a number here, it's a pair, a document term pair, right? So you only have here the document ID, but the pair is actually here. So it's U, U, 6. It's the pair U, 6. Um, here, visually, it's just an edge right here. And an edge corresponds to a tuple in the relation. 
Okay? It's very important to understand it mathematically because then this is, this is very precise. And this here, this kind of tuple here, it's called a posting. It's one occurrence of a term in a document. It's not a term, it's not a document, it's really the pair of both. Because you may have, for example, here you have four, and here you have four, but this is not the same thing. This is V4 and this is X4, okay? This is called the posting. Remember the word posting. So you assume, of course, when you write these postings that each document has a document ID, right? We call them doc IDs, okay? Now, this here is a list of posting of postings, okay? They all share the same term, of course, so that's why you only put the document ID, but this is a list of postings. The list of postings is basically all the ones that are on the same row. That's a postings list, okay? And finally, these are called the postings. So I know this can be confusing, and uh, I'm following the same conventions as the book. Sorry. This is a single posting, this is a postings list, and these are the postings as such, okay? Because it's the whole set of the pairs of term documents, okay? And this is called the, uh, yes, this is called the vocabulary if you only have the terms here, and the dictionary, when you say dictionary, you actually mean everything together, okay? So this is our inverted index. Who is following me? As I said, I want high precision, so when my goal is that when I'm saying who's following me, that I have almost everybody raising their hands. This is my goal. Um, now, there is something else that we do. Uh, when we have this, we can actually count the number of documents in which each term appears. Why? This we will see a bit later, but we will need that. So here we have four, three, five, one, four, and three. So we count them, and it's very... Uh, often that we actually add these frequencies right here before the list, before the posting list, okay? So we keep track in our data structure of the counts, okay? I hope that you see, I think you all took the database course. The, who, to, who took the database course? It's, uh, it's mandatory. So you have seen indices in databases, and I hope you see now that a lot of what we're doing here is very similar to databases. It's exactly the same terminology, indices, queries, and so on and so on, but we are just dealing with unstructured data. Okay, so we can see, for example, that we have the most frequent term, that is here V, so this is what we can do then when we have this kind of inverted index. Um, so let's build one. Let's say we have four documents here, document one, two, three, and four, I'm still using digits, and here we have terms, we have so here it's a list of terms because the order mattered originally, but we are going to abstract this away and lose the order. So first thing we do is we tokenize. Okay, so for example, we can use spaces. It's not as trivial as it seems actually, but let's use spaces so we can tokenize. What's the next step? What can we do now? Any idea? Can we clean things a bit up? You see here, for example, when the, when the sentence starts, there is an uppercase here. D is it what you wanted to say? What did you want to say? Uh, yes, do you know what this is called? There is a name. Who knows what this is called? Okay, these are called stop words. How do you characterize stop words? Formally, based on the former slide, let's say. Uh, they appear or not. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, so I will come back to that. This is also something that I, I will talk about. Uh, this is called the stop word. So yes, this is something you could do. I, I'm not going to do, do this right here. I'm not going to do it, but yes, you could totally remove the stop words. Um, so the thing I had in mind was more here, the uh, taking everything to lowercase. I will come back on how we clean that up, right? But I'm just keeping it simple. So here, just some, it's called also linguistic preprocessing. So now I have pretty standard uh, items here. Uh, I even missed the small 
could have made it lowercase here as well. But basically, this is cleaner, and this is a proper noun, so this, this is why we kept the, uh, the, the uppercase. Okay, so now we've di we did that. Uh, as I said, this was a list, but we want to abstract it away as a set because we don't care about the order, and we don't care about duplicates. So we can, let's say, resort that. So here, what I'm doing here is I'm just assigning document IDs. Everything that was in document one is here, document two, document three, document four. Um, what do I do next? Yes? You merge it, yes, like this. And at the same time, you sort it, right? So you merge the four documents, sort them. So now it's nicely sorted alphabetically by terms, like this. Uh, and there is something else to the merge. You said merge. What am I missing here? The next step. Do you notice something that is not quite, we're not quite there yet? Yes? Exactly. We have only one posting for each term, so we need to merge, right, like this. Okay? And this is where we are. And then we just uh, rearrange and so on. So this is it. We have now our index. So you see there's one, two, three, four. These are the document IDs. These are the terms, nicely sorted. Uh, um, so I, I'm sorting them alphabetically just because it makes it easier for us humans. And uh, there we go. We have our inverted index. Uh, for terminology, this is something that we will call the standard inverted index, because in two weeks we will see that we can modify it and tweak it uh, in some other ways. This is the standard inverted index, and you are going to build one programmatically uh, in the exercise of uh, next week with Python. Uh, you, sh you should program that. And if you manage to program that, then it means that you understood it, right? Never believe that you truly understand something before you actually program it. It's very often that one overestimates the level of understanding that is, uh, that is needed, because then you, you bump into the, all these little details. Okay, so we have our standard index. And I told you we like to add the document frequency for reasons that we will see uh, a bit later. So here I'm adding in purple, the, the, it's just the count. Here we have three postings, so we have three and so on. Okay. Now, let's query it. So we already looked at the query from a matrix perspective, but now we can query our standard inverti inverted index. So who can tell me the documents we are return if I query for, that we return if I query for hour? That should be very fast. This is easy. Anybody? Yes? One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Exactly. Here it is. So you can see. Okay? Uh, so you have document one, two, and three, and we return them, and then you can even organize it, like retrieve the documents. You can even do a grep in the documents uh, locally when you return the results to find the lines, and you can highlight the documents. This is what a, uh, a system typically does. Okay? Um, now let's try a conjunctive query, hour and com. Who can tell me what hour and com is going to return? Which documents? Yes? One and three. One and three. How did you obtain that? Yes. We, we, what, did we, what did we do? <laughs> what verb did you use? Yes, so you, you used a, ver a verb just before. Add. Add. So we, the, can you have a more precise word? Uh, intersection. intersection, yes, that is it. So we want to compute the intersection of two, okay? Uh, so here you can see that documents one and three come hour, come hour, okay? So this is a conjunctive query. Conjunctive query, we intersect the sets, okay? We have now this disjunctive query, a disjunctive query, so we have our or this, what does our or this return?
I know you know. Yes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All of them. So you see, you take the, the union in that case. Okay? And you can check in the document here we have our, 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 and this. Okay? So you can see now how to use the inverted index. If it's a single term, it's very easy. You just look it up and you already have the list. If, however, it is a more intricate query, because we are looking into Boolean queries, um, then there is some post-processing to be done. And this post-processing is union, intersection, and what is the other one? What do we also need to do for some queries? Yes? Negation. The negation, the complements, the set complements. OK. So now, I'm sure that you know how to do that. You probably saw that in your data structure lecture. How do we compute the intersection of these two lists efficiently? Because again, these are lists. How do we compute the intersection? Yes? Yes, you can. Yes, this is, this is uh, I think I haven't told that explicitly, but yes, when you have a posting list, you sort the, the document IDs. They are sorted. Did you design the slides? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay, continue. If they don't match, then uh, you take the lower number and the one is for both. Uh -huh. Until they match. Yeah. Like exactly. So let me say, just because it's recorded, um, what you just said. The way that it works is that we start at, we, we have our pointers at the start of the list. And at every step of the way, we compare what is pointed to. So one and one matches, so we put it in there. Right? Then we move both pointers, because it matched both pointers forward. Then we check again. They are different. We take the lowest, the lower number, and only move that pointer. Then we compare again. They are different. We take the lower pointer and move forward. Then we compare again. It matches, so we copy over four right here. And we move both pointers forward. Then it doesn't match. We take the lower number, move forward, doesn't match. The lower number, move forward, doesn't match. Lower number, move forward. It matches. We copy it over. We move both pointers forward. Then it doesn't match. We take the lower number, move forward, doesn't match. Lower number, move forward, doesn't match, etc. Move forward, matches. And there we go. We have ended. This is exactly the way that you are going to program the intersection of two lists. So I'm assuming who is following? OK. Who already saw that before? Because I'm assuming you already implemented these kind of things in, programmatic, in program programming and algorithms lectures. OK. So now let's do the union. Who can drive me through the union? Because you've already done that. Somebody? Maybe not you, but somebody else? Who can do the union? Can you? Anybody? You? Can you? Yes? Yes, that's the idea. So let me continue also explaining in the microphone what you said. We, it's very similar to the intersection. We, so here it matches, we, we copy it over. Then it doesn't match, so we take the smaller one, but this time we also copy the smaller one over. We just don't discard it. And then we continue, six is the smaller one, we copy it over, then we have seven, then we have eight. It matches, so we just put it once in the output list. Then advance both pointers, then we have nine, 10, doesn't match, 11, and finally 12, and we are done. OK? The devil is in the details. It's when you start implementing that you may run into the small, the small issues of, for example, do you have to use 0 or 1 as a starting point? When do you stop? What is the condition? Of, do you advance both pointers, only one pointer? Do you stop where both pointers are there? Do you stop where only one pointer is there? What is the answer? Do you stop? For example, 
do you stop for the union algorithms where both pointers are at the ends or when one pointer is in, at the end? Yes? Both. And for the intersection? Only one. Only one. Exactly. So you see, this is, this is the, the, the kind of little detail that when you program, you have to actually think about these things. If you look at the book, there's even some pseudocodes that I'm not showing to you right here, but there is, um, there is even the pseudocodes for, for doing that, right? Okay, so we have the intersection of the union and the union, and now we can start thinking slightly bigger. We can start thinking bigger um, because we can have bigger queries than just an AND or an OR or a negation. So AND or negation, we know how to do. The complement of the set, I'm not going to show that to you. you. I'm sure you can find out by yourself. So let's say we have this query here now with AND and AND. So how do we implement that query? Yes? Exactly, so you can take ETH Zurich and then take the posting lists and intersect the posting lists and then you take the posting list of Bibliopole because you also got a posting list out of this, right? And then you compute the intersection. So you intersect and you intersect. What algebraic property do you need to have for this to work? Associativity, yes always keep the theory in mind. So it's associative, so we can, uh, we can basically choose to start here and then do it. Um, but we could also start here, right? You could also start with Zurich and Bibliopol first, right? Or you can even start here and here. But what do you need to be able to start with this one and that one? Associativity? That's not enough. You also need? Commutativity, right? Commutativity, you can reorder. So it's associative and commutative, so how can we optimize that? We could do it randomly, but if we don't want to do it randomly, yes? You first get the cardinality of the sets and then bring them all to the Exactly. Yes. And why can you so easily look at the sizes of the sets? Because it's stored in the index. This is why we are storing the document frequency. So you can see here that, for example, if I see that there's 10 documents that have the word Bibliopole and 10,000 with ETH and 100,000 with Zurich, um, you can see that it's directly uh, something that you have in the inverted index. So you take this and this, and you start computing the intersection between these two, and then uh, you will have a very small posting list, and then you can take it with this one you save a lot of space because the structure is very small. If you started with the most restrictive, infrequent words, you are basically doing it better than if you pick a random order, okay? So this is the kind of things you should also try to implement. If now, for those who don't have enough of it, you want to uh, push it to the next level, there are plenty of ways that you can try to make it harder. So in that case, we sort by increasing document frequency, we maintain the results in memory, merge it, and then it reduces the list, okay? Now, let me go more into getting you to think about estimations of the sizes. So let's say Let's say that we have A and B, and we have A or B. What I want to go now is into Boolean queries that are more complex, not just AND and OR and NOT, but you can also have parentheses and then EPF or ETH in parentheses and Zurich and Bibliopol, if you consider that uh, ETH is also called EPF Zurich in French. You want to query this. So you would like to use the same idea with your end operation. You also want to start with the most restrictive postings list. If you have only terms, that's very easy. If the operands for the ends 
Boolean operation is only terms, you just look it up in the standard index. But here, it's not just a term, it's a, it's a disjunction of terms, EPF and ETH. So assume that we are here in the OR. We have A in the inverted index, let's say it has five terms, and we have B in the inverted index, and the postings list has 10, sorry, not terms, documents. The posting list for term B has 10 documents, the posting list for term A has five documents. Can you give me, for A or B, a max of the number of documents if we compute the posting list by doing the union, for or it's the union, we do the union of these posting lists. What is the maximum number of documents we will have? Yes? 15, 15 yes. How did you get it? Uh, yes. Yes. So this gives you an upper bound. You know that it's upper bounded by the sum of them. Can you have a lower bound? Yes. And what, what, what did you take? Yes. Exactly. So you see, this is already a very good mental exercise to think about these things. Because if you want to push programming to the limits, you can think about these things. Now let's do the same thing. So this is the mean here. Let's compute the, max, the maximum size of the posting list you would obtain with A and B like this. What is this? Ah, that's more tricky, huh? Yes? The maximum number, yes, you could take the mean, yeah. So you cannot have more than the minimum size, okay? And here? Zero. Yes, exactly. I wanted to see if you would fall in the trap. It is zero. Why? What is the worst case? It could have, they could have, the intersection could be empty, exactly. So the worst case would be zero. Um, here, when does that happen? That's the max is equal to this sum. Yes? Also when the intersection is empty. So you see that's a pretty good upper bound. That's a pretty good lower bound. Uh, when we have the minimum, when is it reached when A or B is exactly the max? When does that happen? Yes? How do you call that in terms of set operations? Yes, inclusion. One is included in the other. And here, when do you get that? <coughs> yes? The same, right? So it means that we have pretty good bounds here because they can be reached. So we are pretty good at that. So now you can use that in order to estimate when you have this kind of, uh, of queries. Um, so you can see here that we can estimate here by summing, it's right here, the sum is the maximum number you can have here. Uh, we can also adapt when you have a knot in here, when you have a knot, you can virtually walk down the negated list. Meaning, instead of computing EPF or ETH, and then not Zurich, and then intersecting them, you should take the end knot in the same operation. If you don't, not Zurich is going to give you a huge postings list. It's all the documents that don't contain Zurich. There's too many of them. If you, say the, if you do the end not by adapting the intersection algorithm, then you will save some space and resources, okay? So if you want to push it, do it in the exercises. Those of you who, are, who thinks uh, it was a bit slow today and it's very easy and so on, try to push the exercises that way. Try to program that. And now, let me go even further. Let me go even further, um, making you think. Um, let's imagine that you have, like we want to achieve the ultimate Boolean, Boolean querying system. I don't have, oh, no, I only have two of them. Where do I have some space? Um, Just going to make some space. So 
So let's say now we want the ultimate Boolean querying system and we want any possibility. So it means that we have, for example, uh, we want not E, we want E or E, we want E and E and we want this. So you can actually draw that with an EBNF with a context-free grammar. You can come up with your, uh, the way that you, that you do that. From what I understood, you will get the parser for free, right? So you will get the parser. You won't have to implement the parser. But basically, you can define your language like this, that you can use a negation or an E, and in terms of precedence, this has highest precedence, then this, then this, then this, OK? So you can get pretty complicated formulas, right? Like uh, I'm, I'm using this for end, it's just faster. So you know these notations, right? Okay, you're all familiar with this, right? So this is just a logical first order logics expression, some predicate using variables. Do you know about any canonical form that you can write any such formula in? Have you ever heard of that? I think it's covered. How is it called? There's two of them, yes? Yes, and the other one? Disjunctive normal form. So it means that you can think in, in these terms when you program. If you have a query, transform it to one of these normal forms, conjunctive normal form or disjunctive normal form. Maybe in some cases you could think about that. In some cases, maybe the conjunctive normal form is very good because it gives you a canonical way of having ends everywhere. Plus we have this wonderful, here, we have this wonderful set of bounds that we can use here. So if you have the conjunctive normal form, you can use these bounds for the ors. If there's not, you need to deal with them. But basically, you can actually come up with some pretty good Boolean querying system, right? So um, don't hesitate to try to push it a bit. Um, that's basically it for this, uh, this first week of lecture. So last check. Oh, no, I, do, I don't have the question. So let me do it um, directly here. Who understood absolutely everything I told you today? Very good. That looks very good. Who understood more than 80% but less than 100? Who understood less than 80%? <coughs> That's wonderful. That's exactly what I wanted to achieve. Very good. So now you have everything you need to know. I recommend reading the book. It's the same material. Make sure you know everything in and out, and then try to program it and make sure that you actually understood everything. Okay? And think about the math and the formal, the graph representations uh, in terms of sets, power sets, and so on. Keep the formal aspects in mind. So thank you very much. Uh, exercise session today. Look at the website. There's three rooms that have been assigned to you. Um, I think it's... Uh, Uh, yes, these are the three rooms, CHN D46, G22, and J34.1, depending on your family name. Go there, the TAs will be here for you, and this week is a Python tutorial. The programmation of the Boolean retrieval system is next week. Okay? So thank you very much, and I'll see you next Friday at uh, 9 a.m. <laughs>